Hello, I'm Bill Fegis, and welcome to our Business Transformation 101 podcast. For today's podcast, we have with us Janice Fadden. Janice is the Director of Strategic Engagement for the College of Business at the University of North Alabama. She is also the co author of the book, Strategic Doing 10 Skills for Agile Leadership. In her position at the University of North Alabama College of Business, she builds networks and accomplishes projects that expand the students' capabilities as they launch their careers. She is currently focused on innovative initiative named Shoal Shift that includes launching an incubator, implementing economic development projects, including strategic doing, and improving the MBA recruiting and enrollment process. Janice also has a consulting practice, which assists clients in both the public and private sectors to advance their capacity to succeed with services in leadership, management, strategy, and marketing. Janice, welcome to our podcast, and thanks for taking the time to provide some insight to our listeners. Thanks so much, Bill, and really appreciate being here. Great to have you. So in our first podcast, we stated that uh, to ensure the business provides consistent, sustainable, improving performance, you need to deploy robust processes in all aspects of the business. We also noted that lean applies to any process and therefore is applicable across the business and must be deployed across the enterprise. Earlier in our careers, Janice and I were part of the leadership team at Pacific Scientific or PACSI that had the good fortune of learning about lean implementation when the company was acquired by Danaher. Our team had never heard of Danaher or lean prior to the acquisition, but we all embraced the lean philosophy and successfully utilized it to make significant improvements in the company's performance. Today's podcast is focused on a transformational improvement made in the customer service department at PacSci. This department consisted of 18 customer service reps or CSRs six application engineers or AEs, and a customer service manager. Janice was the VP sales and marketing at PacSci and the customer service department was part of her team. I'll let Janice give us a little description of the current state of the department at that time. Janice. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Uh, I'll start with uh, what happened to me is I went out as a VP of sales would and I visited with our distributors in California had one of our biggest distributors. We were selling motion control products and our product were the motors and the drives. It was the heart of their business. And the owner of that business took me out to the middle of his sales floor and began to dress me down about the, our company's performance, our inability of our customer service department to answer the phone, that they weren't sure if the answer was correct and how many invoices they had to constantly get corrected. And so I listened carefully, I took his information and on the long airplane ride back from uh, California, I realized what little I did know about lean DBS because most of it was happening in the factory, I could apply in the office. At that time, uh, DBS, Danaher Business System, the lean system we used, was not really being used in the office area. So I began to experiment with how we could convert the tools or use the tools in the office. I came back and asked my team, uh, the managers of that group to begin to think about how we were gonna answer three questions. Did we answer the phone? Did we answer the question? And were we correct? Three simple, but complex. You'll find complex questions that each distributor when they made a call needed needed to know the, the answers to those three questions. I told them in that meeting that we were gonna improve by 90%. Uh, and they were looked at me kind of shocked. And I said, we're gonna do this within a year. And uh, I said, we're awful. So 90% shouldn't be that high a hurdle for us to meet. Right. So I think it's from, from your description, it's safe to assume that the uh... This distributor certainly, and I assume the other customers and distributors were not happy with the service. And this obviously was potentially jeopardizing the business. Um, Absolutely. The, the Danaher team had been training us on lead tools for about nine months at this point. But as Janice pointed out, it was certainly more heavily focused to the factory rather than the office. Um, 
And as you noted, you, your team said, hey, maybe we can apply these tools in the, the office and the customer service area. Um, let me note that, that many organizations view the use of lean primarily, if not completely, for application and manufacturing. And I think this is a, a big mistake many companies made. And I think Janice and her team showed it by the results um, they got here. Um, and so these tools are really applicable anywhere, including transactional processes such as customer service. So uh, given the kind of uh, voice of the customer you got there, uh, could you give us a little view of, of the team's view of, of tools that might be applicable to changing uh, the current state? Oh, sure. Thanks, Bill. Um, so the, one of the first tools to look at is, is the 5S tool to look at the work area. And if you recall, the work area was split into three places. So I worked with uh, the people at the factory and relayed out where we were in the office so we could all be in the same area uh, with each other. So 5S, what, what does the area look like and what changes should happen to that area? Uh, then we started to think about standard work watching what work was being done and seeing what could be changed uh, using tools like Going Gemba, just watching the people work and um, Pareto charting, having them Pareto chart over time what they were doing, just simple logs. Um, process mapping, beginning to see how the tasks tied to each other in terms of getting to the answer and understanding where we could measure things. Where do we measure, did we answer the phone? Where do we measure, did we answer the question? Where did we measure, were we correct? And then a visual management of that by beginning to make charts and sharing them with the team. The whole time the team is making these decisions. These are not dictates from management. The teams are engaged in solving this uh, and working together. Okay. I mean, I think you made a great point there about going to Gemba, right? We really want to go out and see what's going on. You don't want to sit in a conference room and, and look at some documents and think you know what's going on. You got to get out there and look Absolutely. and it and, and sounds like that's what you did. So, so you have these tools and obviously to uh, make effective use of these tools, uh, you need data. And uh, when we're out in the factory floor, you know, we have data coming out of our ears. Everything's being measured. There's data all over the place. A little different in office areas. Most office areas you walk into, there aren't a lot of metrics. Things aren't being measured. So that was another challenge. Not only did you have to apply these tools in a different area than the factory, but hey, you had to get data somehow. So could you tell, tell us a little about the challenges in digging up some data? Right. So the, um, one of the things we did first was, like I said, Pareto charts, because the biggest complaint was that the uh, customer service reps were not at their desks. So we asked them to um, kind of convene and, and think of the reasons they're not at their desk and just make a log. You know, there's no blame in lean. So if you, you have to set that culture up right away, because we're not here to, to, to nail anybody's for doing something. We would just want to know what they're doing because whatever decision was made in the past that caused that behavior, we are going to assume at the time it was the correct decision. We have the right though through continuous improvement to change our decisions. And so as long as you bring that philosophy to the, to the uh, team, then they will embrace continuous improvement because you're respecting them for their current work and the changes you're going to make. So we did some manual um, mapping of their work in Pareto charts and 80-20, what is it? And then think, have them think up the answer. What would, what, what, would, what would improve? How could we eliminate doing that step? Whatever that was. And I'll talk to more uh, about the actual things we did. We also were using at the time Oracle as our IT system. And nobody had ever gone over and asked accounting, can we look at the disputed invoices? <laughs> And, and so uh, we found out that 12% of our invoices were disputed. That's a really high amount. Think about that. Uh, uh, the one in 10 chance, more than one in 10 chance, the customer is going to get an incorrect invoice. And then we have to fix it with them. And it irritates them. And it 
And if you think about the forms of waste, this is a big waste for everyone. So uh, how did we, you know, and then we paraded what were the causes of the 12% of the, uh, invoice, invoice disputes. Um, and a lot of them were not uh, because of the factory. They were because of mistakes we made in customer service. Um, and then we found out it was at that time that phone systems were changing and getting smarter. And we found out our phone system did have a software with it. And we began, uh, one of our managers was very interested in software and he began to explore how to best use the phone system and train all of us as to what its capabilities were. And uh, that was really a game changer, the phone system. And uh, we, we kept encouraging the team to tell us what was the problems because many times people are conditioned not to tell you the problems because they think you're going to call them a whiner and nobody will listen anyways. All of a sudden they had an atmosphere where people were actively listening to them and wanting to improve things. And when they saw the improvements, they had a more pleasant job to be a part of. So it was easy to engage the group. Okay. So, so now you have the voice of the customer. Um, you have data on the current performance and you have this suite of lean tools uh, that can be used to move from the uh, current state to the future state. So could you just take us through kind of at a high level, the actions the team took to uh, start to improve the performance uh, of this area? Right, like I said, the first immediate tool we had was this Pareto chart on why did you leave your desk? And we found out the number one reason, remember, this was in the 90s, was to go to the fax machine, of which the company had one. And uh, because they were very expensive, and it sat at the reception desk at the front of the, of the uh, building. And the people would uh, finish their call with their person and say, well, I'll fax that to you right now. And they would leave their desk and go to the fax machine run the fax, chit chat with the receptionist while it was running to make sure that the fax went through. If you remember, you put your fax in, it went in and then you got a, your fax back plus a sheet of paper that said your fax went through. So they were doing this many times a day. And that was the number one reason they left their desks. And so we, uh, they invented a new way, which was we won't leave our desks. The receptionist, who, you know, we didn't really have that many people visiting her factory. Um, and, you know, with the new phone system, she didn't have to transfer calls like she used to. So she became a runner and she would run uh, into the customer service and they had a basket where they put their faxes and all the faxes got sent within the half hour. And she would run them and then run them back. Just an amazing game changer. We um, began to um, also look at other reasons they left their desk. And in the pecking order of the hierarchy of who has what uh, role in a company, in many companies, the engineer and the production people uh, see themselves on top and you have to go find them. Well, that, you know, or they didn't pay attention when customer service was calling. So this caused us at a management level to have meetings and, uh, discuss changing the culture of the business so that people understood if the customer service organization wasn't moving the order that we weren't producing product right. and that when a call came from customer service, it needed to be answered and it needed to be answered quickly. And if they need you to come to their area, you need to come to their area. And um, when we were doing Gemba, um, remember this is all before wireless um, <laughs> we're doing Gemba and we're watching operators customer service operate their desktop computers which were not uh, not really PCs at the time but something like a PC because all simply wired and all that and it was taking about 60 seconds for their screens to come up and so when we call IT over and say tell me why this is happening um, because if you take 60 seconds times the, the tens of call 
you know, they're taking up over 100 calls a day. Now, now we're wasting a lot of time right. waiting. It's a, it's a major of form of waste. <laughs> one, of the, one of the seven forms of waste is waiting. Well, it happened that, that the fastest internet didn't, ethernet in the day, those days, didn't come to the customer service department. It went to engineering so they could do their modeling. And I said, no, we need the fastest right here. And also their computers weren't the fastest. The fastest computers went to engineering, the new ones that were coming in. I said, no, they're gonna come here because we need to free up this time. So we made this significant change, but we wouldn't have seen the change if we didn't know to go Gemba. Right. And the people in the department didn't know that that wasn't, wasn't correct. So sometimes you can't see what is in front of you because you're in the soup. Right. So that's why having people come Gemba is, is not a punishment, but a help. Um, when we started building the process maps of how the calls were to be handled, the customer service uh, department began to look to the phone system because the phone system now began to tell us when calls were coming by hour, by day. All of a sudden we realized that there are certain times of the day, days of the week, that we need people not to be gone from their desk. So that reoriented when we would allow people to take, you know, and we asked them, don't schedule an appointment with a doctor on Tuesdays between 10 and two, right. that's our highest call rate. And so when we had people available, we had less missed calls. Um, we began to um, visually share with everybody in the department what was happening on, in a customer service cell. And the managers would go over it with them about a, so we could have a substantive dialogue about what we could do. Um, I think one of the biggest changes, and it's a big change in a lot of office environments. So you have people doing the same job, but if you have people in the factory doing the same job, they're, they're doing it the same way because you're building the same, you know, building, even though you might have variations of the product. Well, we're all entering orders uh, into the same system, but everybody was doing it their own way. And everyone's desk and work area was set up to their particular pleasure, let's say, that worked best for them. So what we did was we had them share best practices with each other so that we could standardize the desk. The most important part was if you were gone and somebody called about a return, returns weren't entered into Oracle right away. And so we said, everybody put returns in a blue envelope, blue folder and put it here on your desk so we can find it if somebody calls when you're out. Because people don't understand that your question can't be answered because one person is gone. It's not that you're not important to us, but we have to keep things moving. Right. That probably ruffled a few feathers a little bit, but over time when they helped each other and whenever you help a customer and you get a thank you from the customer, then you believe in the change. Um, the other part was that the customer service people said, you know, we've never been trained and this is really key. And that's really true for a lot of departments, they never get right. trained. So in those days there was, and, and I still believe the product's available, uh, there was a video series called Telephone Doctor. And uh, so we brought, we bought the series and actually two of the customer service agents got trained as trainers. And every week they had a, they, you know, during lunch time, they had to train the trainer session with the people in the departments. And they so appreciated helping each other get better answering the phone. We also uh, went to wireless headsets, which were quite, quite modern in the time. Uh, maybe they weren't wireless, but they were headsets. Instead of having the phone, most people had a phone in this foam thing and they cocked their head all day. And it really you know, impeded them from using full two hands. So we put headsets in um, and they, people really enjoyed that too. Right. Yeah, I think to, you know, to Janice made this point several times, obviously the, the technology and what was going on was a little different back then than it is now. Um, but I think the other key thing, you made a couple of points, Janice, one, one was I think the, um, about measuring demand during, um, on an hourly basis, you know, normally on the factory, demand is measured on a daily basis. The operators are there all day. They build, you know, the demand is 500 widgets. They do 500 widgets. In a call center, and this is the case in a lot of transactional areas, I think what the team recognized and looked at was, 
hey, the demand varies during the day and therefore the number of operators needs to be varied during the day, which I think was, that was kind of a key aha moment for me when I was uh, looking at this, but uh, the team did a great job of rearranging to deal with it. And I think there's a lot of things in, in the office area where you have to be a little flexible and tweak and think a little differently about how you use the tools. Right. And another cool thing that the, that the uh, phone system did for us was like when you finish the call, what was happening was uh, the call, we could route calls. So if it was your territory, it would route to you if you were available, but if you weren't next available might take it. Um, but maybe when you finish the call, you still have about 60 seconds of work to complete your input into the computer. So we wanted to make sure that we had one piece flow that you could complete the, the work. And the phone system helped us because you could they could hit a button and it would hold the next call for 60 seconds while they finish their work. Right. Yeah. And uh, that was really uh, helpful because it'll help us minimize mistakes on invoices. Uh, and it would, um, it, it would complete the work so that the order could continue to move forward. I think another key point you, you hit on a little earlier was the, uh, the data collection. I think a thing to keep in mind, um, you know, in, in the office area and when you're doing this, you don't have to put a data measurement system in place. In the one case, as you said, hey, you just collected data for two weeks from the, uh, the CSRs and the AEs. And um, so once again, don't don't overthink this or overdrive it. Get some data, get some reasonable data. And, and this falls in the category of don't let perfect get in the way of better, right? You don't need a right. perfect data measurement system go in there. So you did all this stuff. We're doing all this. So can you give a little kind of overview of, of the results of doing this series of Kaizen events in action? Oh, yeah, it was really fulfilling. Um, so remember at the beginning, I said, I, I, I told this, you I wanted to uh, I set a goal of 90% improvement, Right. you know, because in, in, in uh, Danher business system, they really wanted stretch goals. That's a stretch and, goal. Uh, <laughs> and that was a stretch goal. And it was like in a year we were, we were supposed to reach that. Well, you know, they reached 84% in six months and uh, we had tremendous reductions in abandoned called calls in providing answers because uh, the answers uh, got better and better in the system. We, 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 we didn't talk too much about it, but we started to use some software that would help us improve our ability to answer, make sure the answer was there available to people. Uh, the number of callbacks needed was much less. And we, had, we were down under 4% disputed invoices. Um, one of the things we found with disputed invoices, and, and this is the way uh, Dan, Dan, you know, Lean teaches you is first look at the process, then look at the tool, and then look at people. And what it got down to is it was one person, one, one form of error is pricing errors. Uh, so there was still a file cabinet full of manual price cards that had never been put on the computer. So I, I uh, assigned, we assigned someone to, to, to convert those cards into cards that could be put on the computer. But one person, um, made pricing errors, a lot of pricing errors. And right. once we trained that person, she didn't make any more pricing errors because nobody had trained her. Right. So when people are making mistakes, you have to look to training first and give them an opportunity to improve. Right. Um, so we had a national uh, sales meeting of the distributors about nine months after I'd started, after I had my dressing down in Los, <laughs> in the Los Angeles area. And uh, that same, uh, owner came up to me at the, at the sales meeting and said, I don't know what you did with your customer service team, but it's the best I've ever worked with. Thanks for all you did in such a short time. It's just incredible. The changes that has, have made you the best now that we have, you're a standard for us. So, you know, everyone in the department felt better about the work. They knew they added value and overall people were having a better time in the job. Um, we became an early adopter of customer relationship management tools. We used a tool in those days called Goldmine, which was one of the uh, beginning tools. And I told you we had a guy uh, in the department who um, embraced software and he taught us how to use it. And what happens is everyone can see the customer. And, you know, my very first lesson in Lean, 
uh, at Danaher was learning to see. Right. You can't fix what you can't see. So that's why it made it important for us to have visual management in the area, visually see the desks, visually uh, understand what was going on. When we moved everyone in the same area, we lowered the walls so people could physically see each other and uh, call on each other if they needed to. Uh, with the headsets, they could had some movement uh, to get to somebody and say, come help me here. Uh, so it's been, uh, a tr it was a tremendous experience and it's lived with me uh, as one of the finest things I've done with lean in my career. Right. Okay. Thanks, Janice. You know, I, I've been uh, implementing lean processes for 20 plus years and I still hold this series of Kaizans and the work that was done by this team out, out as one of the most impactful improvement outcomes I've seen. It, um, and part of it is it had a significant impact to the experience customers had in interacting with the company. And although we, we couldn't measure it or, or, you know, it's a little bit of a soft thing, I'm pretty sure it likely drove expanded revenue and also prevented a loss of revenue. Kind of tough to measure that stuff, but ultimately also lean is always about coming back to the customer. And this really was completely centered around the customer. Um, it also, as you noted, improved the work environment for the CSRs and the AEs, uh, first by defining the expectations and then giving them the appropriate tools and training that allowed them effectively uh, service customers. And I'm sure it eliminated a lot of anxiety and, and tension that uh, had previously existed. Nobody wants to be, as we all know, having discussions with uh, upset customers. It's never a fun thing. Um, and I, you know, ultimately this, uh, this favorably impacts shareholders, um, through improved, uh, revenue and profit. So, uh, Janice, congratulations to you and the team back then that, uh, drove this improvement. And, uh, once again, thank you for taking the time to join our podcast. If you want to learn more about Janice, you can go to her LinkedIn page at www.linkedin.com slash in slash Janice Fadden. That's J-A-N-Y-C-E-F-A-D-D-E-N. Janice's book, Strategic Doing, can be found on amazon.com in hardcover, Kindle, or audio format. Also, Janice will be joining us in a future podcast to give us some insights into the strategic doing process. So we'll look forward to doing that later. Um, in the interest of continuous improvement, I invite feedback from our listeners. Please share your thoughts and ideas on these weekly podcasts and feel free to suggest topics which you believe would provide useful to you and our listeners. Janice, once again, thank you for joining us on today's podcast. And to everyone out there, please join us for next week's podcast when we discuss why I hate monuments. Thanks, Janice. Thank you, Bill.